On this week's Fast TV, we visit Knocknagale Farm near Inverness to hear about the Scottish Government's Crofting Cattle Improvement Scheme. Knocknagale is owned by the Scottish Government which leases pedigree beef bulls to crofters who may not be able to afford or have the facilities to winter and maintain a bull. We visit crofter George Mackay who discusses the benefits of the scheme for his business. Mark Pearson from Moray Coast Vet Group talks us through the importance of carrying out pre-breeding fertility assessment for bulls. And Sarah Balfour from SAC Consulting highlights the main considerations when bringing a new bull home to your farm. Hi, I'm John Cowan and I'm the farm manager for the Scottish Government Bull Stud at Knott Gale on the southern outskirts of Inverness. At the bull stud, we normally have a core of about uh, between 130 and 140 bulls. The Crofting Cattle Improvement Scheme is designed to supply bulls to the former crofting area to groups of crofters who can't afford to or cannot have, do not have the facilities to winter a bull and maintain a bull. The scheme itself dates back for more than a century, which was originally a free supply scheme for bulls, but it's evolved over the decades to the format it is in now, uh, which is the supply of high quality bulls to areas where they would normally not be able to source such bulls. We're looking for primarily good feet, good legs, um, good locomotion because the terrain that the bulls are going to sometimes can be quite rough so the bulls have to be able to walk as you should be in any bull that you're picking. Uh, we're also looking at conformity to breed uh, size. You can have bulls that are far too big or far too small for the purpose. We look at their health status but it's, we normally purchase from pedigree sales which is it's a prerequisite for that. We're looking at their EBVs and we aim for the top 40%. We avoid high calving indexes. We try and have a good um, beef free tail index in some breeds. And also terminal sire index comes into it as well. And it's not just down to me. I have a team of five people who come with me to the sales because it's a busy time. They're all pedigree breeders or have been involved in it. So it's not just my opinion on the day. We have a bulk of the popular breeds, predominantly limousines. We have approximately 60. And then Aberdeen Angus will be the next with about 25. Then Simmental, uh, there's about 15 of those. Short turn, about the same. And then Solaire's, Lings. We have a Hereford uh, and a handful of Charlies and one British Blue who's not back yet. How do farmers and crofters get involved in the scheme? They apply to us, they contact me or the, the local office and we have an application form that goes out usually this time of year. They apply, they're given a choice of breeds of bulls, how many they want and also when they want it delivered. If a bull goes lame or is injured, we get the crofters to initially contact their vet to get them checked by a vet. Um, we pay for the veterinary bills because it's far more efficient process than then claiming back. And then we'll react to that, uh, go and collect the bull and replace him within the, the season. The bulls themselves aren't insured because they're crown property. Um, so that is just covered by general crown indemnity. However, we have a public liability insurance that is part of the scheme fee that covers the custodian and the, the township for public liability if there are any accidents. We're not actually a part of any of the health schemes, but the bulls are all purchased at society sales, so they are from health scheme herds. And a bulk of the crofters who take our bulls are part of health schemes due to um, subsidies previously given to join schemes. Um, so we, Rather than being in a health scheme, we work in parallel with the health schemes. Um, any bull that comes in is blood screened for yonis, uh, BVD, etc., all the diseases, um, and they're annually tested. They're actually yonis blood and dung sampled when they come back at this time of year, and also 
in the middle of the winter before they go out. Likewise with fertility testing, we fertility test absolutely everything that comes in from new bulls, regardless of they've be, whether they've been fertility tested at the sale. Um, usually after Christmas, that's when we start and we do the, a blanket test on the herd. I would say fertility testing is an absolute necessity and very valuable. Um, when we started annual fertility testing here, we were surprised that we had quite a proportion came back for retest. Um, it's not worth assuming that a bull worked last year perfectly and he's going to work again because there's all sorts of problems that can develop. When our new bulls come home, they are taken into the quarantine building and they'll remain there for at least four to five weeks. Usually it's up to two months. We will then routine blood test them and do a broad spectrum blood on them to know what's in them. They will also be TB tested. We take them in and start them on slowly onto uh, our maintenance diet, but they will also get a pedigree bull mix. We try not to put too much in front of them to start off with, and usually within the week they're, they are starting to eat and uh, settle into their conditions. So I'm Mark Pearson, I work for Murray Coast Vet Group, and we're here at the Scottish Government Bull Stud at Knockna Gale, just outside Inverness. The job today is carrying out the pre-breeding fertility assessment of the bulls. Um, it's a really important job to do here because these bulls are let out, so we need to be sure, we have confidence that they're uh, able to work when they go out. It's also a really good idea for anyone who's keeping working bulls. Um, there's nothing worse than finding out at PDing time, or at calving time even worse, that a bull hasn't been working. So routinely checking them to make sure they're fit to work before you put them in with the females just makes good economic sense. So the issues and problems that I commonly see with bulls, um, a lot of bulls break down due to lameness and injury. Unfortunately, despite being great big males, they are surprisingly delicate. Um, so foot problems, joint problems, um, and anything that causes a bull to have any issues, whether it's feet, uh, joint injuries, um, just a passing temperature, passing infection that gives them a high temperature, um, that can adversely affect fertility. So the ideal time to carry out a fertility check would be at least eight weeks before you want your bulls to work. Um, the idea behind that is it gives you time to react to whatever we find when we do the check. So the sperm production cycle of a bull is eight weeks long. Um, if a bull fails on the fertility test, we would always look to retest him. So you need to give him an eight-week window before you retest him. Um, so doing it at least two months before breeding gives the opportunity to do that. Ideally, if you do it a little bit sooner, you might still have the opportunity to buy a replacement bull if you need to. Across all the fertility testing that we do, we do um, routine fertility testing of bulls that um, aren't suspected to have a problem. So farms will just test their bulls every year or, or pre-breeding twice a year. Um, and also, obviously, we test bulls that are um, already suspicious for various reasons. But across all the data of all the vets who are doing fertility testing in the UK, uh, the rate of infertility in bulls, or subfertility rather, is 20%. So one in five bulls would fail the fertility test. Um, and if you're a fairly standard commercial farm, the odds are you'll be running five bulls. There's a reasonable statistical chance that one of those bulls won't be doing a good job for you. Okay, so now we've got him in the crate. I just trim some of the hair off the prep use. When we're collecting the sample, the less contamination, the better it is for looking at it. So it's not really critical. If they draw the penis out a long way, they'll come past all this, which gives us more chance of getting a cleaner sample. Then we judge his body condition score. So perfect working condition for a bull is three and a half out of a score from zero to five. These bulls are going to be back in the stud for a while before they go back out, so they've got time to put condition on, and they're still recovering from working last year. So they're kind of middling condition at the moment. This bull's actually at three and a half, so that represents quite a nice working condition, fit but not fat. So he really only needs holding at that. So now I'm going to check his scrotum and his testicles. So I'll take both testicles down, and then let one move up in the scrotum, let the other move up in the scrotum. I'm just checking that there's no adhesions, there's nothing making the testicles stick inside the scrotum, making sure that they're fairly symmetrical, they both move freely, and I'm also checking for consistency and firmness of each testicle. They want to be kind of like ripe fruit. These are maybe just a little bit on the soft side, but that's just a seasonal thing. 
think he's just recovering as he's back in the stud. So there's nothing seriously wrong with those. Checking the tail of the epididymis, which is the lump at the bottom, the head of the epididymis up at the top, and then putting them both in one hand to measure the scrotal circumference. And for a bull to pass the BCVA standard for bull fertility, he needs to have a scrotal circumference of at least 34 centimetres. And this boy is 38. So now we're ready to collect from this bull. Um, we're going to set the machine to run on a pre-programmed schedule. I'm trying to keep the tube warm in my hand because it's a cold day and the sperm needs to be kept as close to body temperature as possible. The process starts with a gentle amount of stimulation. So to start off with, the bull just feels a little bit of stimulation and shuffles a little bit as he settles into it. You can see the rhythm of the pulses. That's the stimulus that he's feeling. and encourage him to straighten his penis. There's a little bend back here that you can just straighten out. So you can get a good look at it and make sure it looks normal. You get a little bit of blood flowing into it obviously during the process, so it goes a little bit redder, but that's perfectly normal. The drips coming off at the moment is pre-seminal fluid, so I'm just watching it closely and waiting for it to turn. Just turn there into that cloudier liquid. So this is the sample that we want to collect. And that's plenty, that's a representative sample, so I'll just turn the machine off. And then keep that warm and go and have a look at it. It's a good sample, John. So this is a thermostatically controlled water bath, so it's keeping the water at 37.5 degrees. The idea is to try and keep the semen at body temperature all the way through the process. If it gets cold, then um, its movement slows down. Take a drop of that, put it onto the microscope slide, and then we're going to look at it under 40 times magnification. And this is just a judge of concentration. Oh, this is a good sample. So we're looking for that wave motion there. There we go. So at this magnification, you can see the individual sperm, They're kind of tadpole shape. So you can see their heads and their tails and we need 60% of them at least to be swimming strongly forwards. So here we've got some inactive sperm. So you can see that they're just sitting there, head there and tail there, not really moving along. But in the background, there's plenty that are moving. We're looking for progressive movements, that's sperm cells coming in from one side of the screen and moving busily and directly across the screen. So, Perfect. so that's good. This bull is surpassing 60% quite nicely, so he's passed the test. Well, I'm George Mackay, and I'm third generation in the farm here at Two Gleck Ardross, which is uh, over the, the Struy Hill heading towards Bonner Bridge. We're at uh, 800 feet, rising to 1,000, and we're the highest cultivated farm in Russia. So uh, we used to grow all our own crops, but now we're totally grass. So uh, as a third generation here, we've soon been here 100 years here. So, Hopefully we can survive with the next two generations coming along, son and grandson. Well, it's 110 acres over here. It was, it was actually two department holdings when my grandfather took it on. And then he bought it in the early 1960s. And uh, so we've been running cattle and sheep. We have uh, 27 cows over here at the moment. Having sold store to the Dingwall Mart. I'm a great believer in supporting the Mart. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. So people should use it. Well, it must be over 20 years ago now. It's when I dropped the cattle down and went on to the smaller lots. And uh, we were, we, we had, when I was running the herd before, it was mostly Charlie's we did. But now we went on to the limousine for, well, for easier coughing when you weren't around so much. And we've never had any problems. Quite bulls, no hair problems, you know, and it's, it's, they've done as well. Like I would say one thing, you, you don't have the capital outlay to buy a bull for a start. And, uh, and they're, all, they're always high health schemes, and if anything does go wrong, you, they're exchanged them. So it's, it's a bit of a you know, guarantee you're always going to have a bull. Well, when we get the bull, we normally, we normally keep the bull as long as, we, as he's been a good bull and serving well and leaving good calves. And uh, any problems, we had one problem, and the bull was exchanged within a matter of days. So if you had your own bull, well, it's very difficult finding another bull. 
I, I know he did all got all the health status attached to it, like, you know. So it certainly works that way, you know. And they're and they're they're buying very good quality bulls now. They had a foot problem, which wasn't very often. The, the, it was paid by the, the, the Crofters Commission, which also was a big saving. And they came in with a turning crate and did the bull, which is the best way to do a feet like. So we've never had any other health problems. As you know, they're all BVD and brucellosis clear like. You know. <coughs> Having had BVD, I know what it's like. And I can honestly say that since we've got BVD clear, pneumonia and the uh, scour of the calves is almost a thing of the past. So the two were definitely related. We've always had, well, good quality calves. Uh, we've limited what we're using. This is the first year we've had Simmentals, and uh, they'll be sold in April time, like in, in Dingwall. So no, they were always good quality calves. Overall, George continues to have a good experience with the bull hire scheme. Well, I would say for a kick-off, you're going to probably get very good quality bulls, and you know the health status is 100%. And I say the back up that we had, you couldn't fault it, like, you know, so I would say for a small number of herds, it'd be ideal. You know? Sarah Balfour from SAC Consulting's livestock team talks us through the important considerations when buying a new stock bull. Buying a new stock bull is a major investment for any business, so it's important to get your bull off to the best start. When you get your new bull home, it's a good idea to give him a wash to take away and remove any of the soaps and sprays that might have been used on his coat as part of the show and sale preparation. Leaving these in his coat can cause skin irritation and can lead to hair loss. So as I said, it's a good idea to give him a good wash when he gets home. However, only do this if you're confident in handling the bull and ensure that you have the correct facilities for handling the bull and for washing him. It's advisable to do this alongside someone else on the farm for health and safety reasons. And if you really don't feel comfortable washing your new bull, then perhaps this could be done at the market with the previous owner, the person you bought your bull from, again, for safety reasons. The most important things to think about is diet transition and change of diet. So in the run up to the show and the sale, the bull will have been fed on a diet mainly of concentrates to get him into show and sale condition. When he comes home, it's important to slowly change this diet and to slowly transition him onto his new feed. A sudden change in diet can cause stress, which can affect sperm production and semen quality, thus affecting the bull's fertility. So it's important to allow for a gradual change in his diet. Remember, the bull will not simply have been fed on forage, so it's important to gradually reduce the concentrates he's fed and introduce more forage into his diet. When your new bull comes home, he will need to be quarantined like any other new animal being moved on farm. He'll need a, a period in isolation or in quarantine, but that doesn't mean that he should be put at the bottom end of a shed in a pen, away from what's going on around him so that he can't see contact with other animals. It's really important that when the bull is in quarantine or in in his period of isolation, that he can still see other stock around him. Remember that in the run up to the show and the sale, he will have had a lot of close human contact. He'll have been haltered, he'll have been walked, he'll have been washed regularly in the run up to the sale. So it's important that when he's in the quarantine, uh, that he can still see other animals, he can see what's going on round about him. This all gives him time to settle into his new environment and get used to you. Let him hear your voice. Let him see what's going on around about him. Again, sudden changes can cause stress. And as we've said, stress can affect semen quality and sperm production, therefore affecting uh, your bull's fertility. So after the quarantine period is over, it's important to ensure that your bull is given exercise before he's put out to work with the cows. Allowing him exercise in a small paddock will mean that he gets to use his legs and his muscles that he's going to use when he's serving cows. Think of it in terms of an athlete warming up before taking on the 100 metres. He wouldn't simply just get up off the bench and run the race. And it's the same for the bulls that may have been in a pen uh, for a period of time. The other thing that you may want to think about before you put your new bull out to work with cows or with heifers is to get a pre-breeding assessment carried out by your vet. Nowadays, a number of bulls are already semen tested at the sale. But remember, 
that only reflects one point in time. There are many things that can in influence and affect semen quality and semen production between the sale day and the bull being turned out um, to work with cows. So it's worthwhile getting the vet out to give him a pre-breeding assessment to check his testicles for swellings, to check uh, that his testicles are, are of an even size and to semen sample him to make sure um, that the quality is there and that he's capable of doing the job when you then put him out with the cows. Another key thing to be thinking about is when you put your new bull out to work with cows for the first time is to watch and observe him serving cows in the first wee while just to ensure that he knows the job, that he's managing to serve correctly um, because there's no point waiting to a later point down the line to discover that actually your bull's incapable of serving cows for whatever reason. The other key thing to think about is insurance. Make sure that your new bull is insured and also make sure that you have read the insurance policy and you know exactly what your bull is insured and what he's covered for in terms of fertility and mortality. Soils are still really wet, so that's the kind of dominating feature for our poor crops. But as we near the end of February, we're beginning to think of spring, so it's worth kind of going crop by crop through the crops that are in the ground now. Um, we've had more heavy rain and, and snow, so spring may feel a long way off, but it's that getting round crops, walking them, deciding which to keep, and if there are some that are, are sufficiently poor that you think you need to take them out. The winter barleys don't enjoy wet feet, so are looking a bit yellow around the country, um, but for the most part the ground cover was reasonable when we hit the autumn storms. Very little in the way of disease, but you might want to start walking and then that guides your tea, not decisions. So sometimes a bit of early cleanup might be necessary and will buy you a bit of flexibility um, before you get to the main T1 timings. The winter wheats, I think we're going to have really two different crops this year. So the ones that were in early with good cover by September, early October are, are looking OK in the main. Um, so getting around them, making tea, not decisions. We've no yellow rust to speak of, but that may, may yet arrive. And again, that can help decide what you're doing at T0 and, and T1. Um, some winter wheats were drilled right through um, soils have really been too wet to get much in the way of the later January, February wheat in. There was, there was chat about that. But we're really now past the stage of getting winter wheat into the ground. Winter Aussie drape, we're standing in a crop here that's been pretty well grazed by pigeons. Um, but a lot of light leaf spot sprays were missed. So again, it's getting around them, judging how much is in the crop. There seem to be bits of light leaf spot established this year, so really try and, and uh, get onto that early. But ground pretty impassable at the minute. Some weed control decisions still to be made too. And then it's really planning for the spring crops as well. So clearly there's an uptick in spring barley this year. If you're home saving seed, then get it tested for germination and some of the seed borne diseases. And that will help you decide on the seed treatments that you need. None of the seed treatments now deal with all our seed borne diseases. So make those decisions on a case by case basis and treat if you have to. Um, because spring barley is going to be, you know, really the, the, the big crop next year. Mm -hmm.